Okay, we'll um, just resume. Continue from where we left off. Okay. So, um, so we see that um, music was part of the worship in the Old Testament. Okay. So I think um, sometimes, you know, even today there's a kind of a debate, right? You know, does music have the rightful place? Right? Does it have a place in worship? Uh, or is there an overemphasis on singing and music? Yes. Yes, we can actually make that mistake of overemphasizing music, uh, overemphasizing, you know, singing as worship. Um, but we should not forget that it has a place. Scripturally, it has a place in worship, right? Um, and we we see that yes, there is kind of a you know an unfolding, a pattern of worship right through the scriptures, right to where it is right now, right? So we see that, and of course, when we when we look at John chapter four, and we see that yes, the Lord gives that instruction, which means that it is a very creative expression, you know, when we look at all that can come into worship, or out all with, with all that we can worship Him, but it means that it is spirit and truth, and everything else comes together. Right? It is from a place of spirit and truth. Uh, question okay. Master, like regarding music, yeah. Recently, like I saw a YouTube video, it's a, it's a Tamil songs, but it's in regional side, they're singing. It's in a regional style, it's yeah. It's a regional style, like uh you call like Kutu style. Yeah. So, like what I saw the comments is like this is not biblical. Mm. The song is like actually that song is um composed in different style. But they put different beat and they start singing. Okay, okay. But people are worshiping. Mm, but mm. like the comments are like, you are mocking to Jesus. Mm. So is it right way like we can do the regional beat and we can yeah. uh, sing songs? Mm. Yeah. So the thing is when uh, see in a song, if you see uh, a song, there is a message in a song, right? So it can be a message. Uh, for example, it can be a message of victory. You're proclaiming victory, you're saying, "Okay, there, there's victory in the in the name of Jesus," and uh, that. Let's say, for example, if that is the message. Okay, so how does one portray that? Express that? You know, probably as a songwriter, you sat down and wrote, and you said, "Okay, you know, it has to be explosive. It has to uh, it has to talk about victory. It has to talk about war. It has to talk about." you know, uh, uh, like victory over darkness. So with all that, a lot of emotions come in, right? So so when you look at music, adding music to that song, to these words, now how do you express that well? Right? So you will make it upbeat. You, you could, you could make it upbeat. You could make it in the, you know, uh, uh, like very uh, energetic. You could do that. Now, when we say, you know, there are different styles of music, right? Different genres of music. You could use, uh, you know, even if it's like a Western classical, you can still make it, you know, uh, what do you call victorious and can express that, right? Uh, like, for example, if you if you heard the Hallelujah Chorus, I don't know if you, you know, uh, Handel's Messiah, you know, Hallelujah Chorus. Hallelujah. Right? You heard that, right? So it's a it's a very triumphant, very joyous celebration, right? And you can use okay, that's Western classical, but then you can use other genres. You can use uh, you know, contemporary, you know, rock, or you can use hip hop or pop, and you can use kutu, right? Which is a very um, you know a village and a rural kind of a thing, and but that is also the same thing. So you can do that, and so it is what you're expressing. So suppose you're saying Jesus loves me, this I know, and you know something like that in Kutu, you know, it, Kutu style. Right? It also it also conveys it, right? So you but you need to be sensitive to what is the message that you're conveying through that form of 
music. So if there is a mismatch between the form of music uh, or the genre of music and the message, then it doesn't sit well. See, that's the that is where the problem arises. You know, if there is a, maybe it's a song of confession, and you're putting you know like a kutu style of thing, it doesn't go well because right. Uh, so that's the thing. So that that is the issue to be uh, considered, and not that hey, this is uh, satanic music or you know. So music really, literally is, uh, I would say, amoral. Right? It's how you use it and what you use it for. And what words go with it? So that makes it uh, whether it's you know it's of the truth or it's of the lie or whether you're worshiping God or not. You know, that's the thing. So yeah, many people don't. You know, say for example, uh, a lot of people feel that okay, uh, in the church or when it comes to you know worshiping God, there should be only a certain kind of music or let's say what is called as church music. Um, but you'll be surprised when when Martin Luther, you know, wrote some of these songs, and those days, like we're talking about those days, when when they were singing of hymns, some of those songs that they sang, you know, they said that hey, this cannot be used for church because those days after the Dark Ages, or you know, as we're going through the thing, Dark Ages, uh, it was more of chanting, it was more of chanting and liturgical prayers and and something that is sung in a monotone, da, 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 you know, like a chant. And here, you know, Martin Luther is writing these songs, a mighty fortress is our God, and you know, songs like that, and in German, translated now in English. And, and people said, hey, this cannot be, you can't sing it. This, should, this is sung in bars and, you know. So you see, every, every age, every generation, Thinks that you know music, whatever they're saying, you know, it should be to the, like how their generation or previous generation. Drums were not used in church. It is only a church organ which should be used. And drums are considered drums were considered sinful and etc. So we understand where they are getting at. You know, they want to express in the right way, and that's it. Um, so as long as we keep to that, then there is no problem. There is no confusion. Why are people disturbed? Because maybe there is a mismatch between the words, the idea that they are conveying, and the kind of music. That's the thing. Yeah. Like, uh, so in regional things only, there are some temple instruments. Mm. So we can play music inside our church with that instrument. Like when you say temple instruments, what are these? Like in case, like in Kerala, if you take chanda is there. Mm -hmm. In Tamil Nadu, that I don't know the name. Nadaswaram. Yes, yes, yes. Like that. Wind so, instrument. Nadaswaram is there. And, then, and all. Uh, and so then, we can use that in our church. We can make music with that. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the see, the thing is that. Just because something is used in worship of a particular deity, right, doesn't mean that you cannot use it in worship of God, right? So the thing is this: that um, okay. The problem is, as a culture, as a society, the minute you play a chanda, chanda or the minute you play a murdangam, people are thinking about that wedding or nadaswaram. You know, people are thinking about the wedding when they heard, and it was, you know. It was typical traditional, you know, that of that religion and so on. So their mind goes back to that. And then they find it difficult to sing about Jesus. So that's the problem. It's not that the music itself or the instrument itself is sinful in any anyway. It's the association, right? Okay, I'm whereas if you if you go to another culture, a completely different culture, maybe in an island or you know, uh, where there are a group of people, and you use the same instruments. For them, it won't make any sense. They, they, are, they are able to. Why? Because in their mind, they don't have that reference point. So that is the only thing. So there's nothing sinful about the instrument itself, but for the people, it creates a conflict because that is what they are used to. That is the thing. So the thing is, okay teaching 
uh, when people get a revelation that hey this can be used it's not a problem you know it's it's relevant it's our culture you know as long as culture does not contradict truth we can go for it right so that's the thing yeah and yeah also you know questions like you know this sounds like film music well where does film music come from you know it's it's an expression of some of those sentiments well if the if the sentiment that you're expressing to god you know it it conflicts with that kind of music don't use it let's on right okay uh, any other questions uh, online students or anything that you want to add on okay so let's look at um, you know when we look at psalms obviously there are a lot of references to music there's a lot of references to to um, singing and uh, you know i think psalm um, psalm 150 is a classic example right um, you can probably read that psalm 150 Okay, Psalm one fifty. It says, uh, "Praise the Lord! Praise God in His sanctuary! Praise Him in His mighty firmament! Praise Him for His mighty acts! Praise Him according to His excellent greatness!" Then, verse three onwards, it talks about the different kinds of instruments. Right? Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the lute and harp. Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. Praise Him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise Him with loud cymbals. Praise Him with clashing. symbols and then ends like let everything that has breath praise the lord so it talks about dance it talks about you know i think uh, another reference talks about clapping it uh, and psalm 91 is also another uh, you know um, psalm that you can go to for different postures in worship right psalm 91 if you see talks about um, um sorry psalm um uh, 95 right sorry not psalm 91 95 So it talks about you know singing, shouting, thanksgiving, shouting joyfully, Psalm ninety five, right? And then you look at verse six. It says, "Come, let us worship. Let us bow down. Let us kneel down, etc." So, so we see all that different expressions. We see different instruments, and and so we see different postures. We de- we see you know songs, right? All that uh, we. Um, Uh, sorry just one so all that we see right so some questions we can ask and these are the basic questions that we also you know this is a reiteration okay so who worships god right who is expected to worship god what are we worshiping with which is you know which answers the question of music and instruments and so on and and where should we worship when should we worship how why etc right so so we're looking at this evolution of worship if you can if you can call it that right there in scripture and we see these expressions in the word of god valid expressions valid um ways in which like people worship god right so okay so who should worship everything that has breath right psalm 150 the last verse says let everything that has breath praise the lord okay and so some hundred talks about you know shouting the lord worshiping him shouting to the lord worshiping worshiping him with gladness coming before him with joyful songs and and it talks about singing again it talks about praise again it talks about giving thanks to him and so on so so all these you know uh, it it just answers the question you know who should worship right uh, and it also it, it also very clearly describes in what manner we should worship So where should we worship? Well, this again, this question we we answered when we studied praise and worship. Where should we worship? Practically any place, right? It's not just the place where people gather together. It is also when you are on your own, right? So traditionally, the understanding is okay. I when people gather together, that is where we, that is where worship happens, or that is where praise happens, right? uh when it comes to expression of praise and worship you know that is the understanding that when when there is a gathering when there is a crowd when there is a congregation but we know that it's not that right uh it is just one aspect of expression of worship which is congregational but 
you know our personal lives when we are on our own in fact i think some 149 verse 5 is a, is a is a great uh, example it says once uh, what we might think as a very uns unspiritual position or one unspiritual place right 149 and verse 5 it says let the saints be joyful in glory let them sing aloud on their beds okay so which means that okay you know is there a place where you can't worship god you know lying down hey come on get up you know sometimes we tell no how can you just lie down and sing get up stand up well this person is lying down on the bed and, and the psalmist is exhorting let the saints sing aloud on their beds you know probably they're just going going to lie down and sleep or they just woke up says let's do that let the saints sing do that okay so again when should we do it it's all the time right the scripture talks about you know several verses talk about you know the morning time he says i will awaken the dawn actually a lot of references talking about the morning meaning that's when you start the day right so which means that you've you've rested now you're conscious and awake and the first thing that you do is that you praise god you worship god right the first thing that comes out of your heart is praise and worship to god, worship god right so um so there's a lot of emphasis there are a lot of uh, references uh, to the start of the day okay but now we know that you know if we are working in a different kind of environment or working for a different time zone your start of the day becomes maybe by afternoon your start of the day could be evening right so then what do you do you know does that mean that biblically you are going wrong in your expression of praise and worship right you're not actually doing the right thing no right so well it's it's great you know if we can do it in the morning but then you know the start it's the beginning of their day you know it's when you you finish your rest and you wake up and you begin to praise and worship the lord you know psalm 34 verse 1 well it's it's referring to seasons and it's referring to, referring to a choice when the psalmist says i will bless the lord at all times his praise will continually be in my mouth right on my lips um that is psalm 34 and verse 1 at all times right meaning all seasons and also in all time zones and all time frames right um so so that that's that's something you know about place about time then we come to this question of how should i worship like how should i praise and for that we see different postures different instruments uh being mentioned there right we are looking at focusing on the psalms right so psalm 33 and uh, and verse 3 talks about how you need to sing and play and do it with skill right psalm 33 verse 3 sing to him a new song play skillfully with a shout of joy okay and verse 2 talks about praising the lord with the harp talking about instruments and melody and so on so um so we see that okay when if if, if anybody wants to know how i should do it okay these are the various methods you can do it right again we talking again we just want to reiterate that the heart of it if you're going to worship the lord with the music the heart is the heart's posture is one that of intimacy with him one that of connectedness with him without that any expression becomes a physical exercise that's all lifting of hands standing and you know shouting and clapping and jumping and dance everything becomes just a empty physical expression right the core of it the foundation of it is that your heart is the heart's posture is the lord himself you know, you're posturing you're you're focusing on the lord right so psalm 63 lifting of hands right psalm 149 verse 3 there is dance being mentioned psalm 47 verse 1 clap your hands all you nation shout to god the tri voice of triumph or with cries of joy right sing to the lord a new song a song that is not written before a song that was not heard before sing to the lord a new song something that is fresh right 
Shout for joy to the Lord. Psalm 98 says, Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Um, so we see that um, you know, over and over again, these are several of the expressions. Right? Now, um, what about the New Testament? You know, what about the change in covenant? What about the cross? Um, and what about the fact that the Lord says, you know, you worship in spirit and in truth? So does that cancel out the Old Testament way or in these exp all, the Old Testament expressions of worship? What do you think? Because there is, there is this line of thinking, right? Like, that was Old Testament. You did it. You know, there are all these physical expressions. But now, your spirit is born again. And the Lord Jesus himself said, you worship in spirit and truth. So worship is by the spirit, of the spirit. And you don't need this. You know, there's a thing. So there's no singing. What do you think? Is that valid? In, in your heart, you know it's not valid. But then why? Um, okay, there's a question here. Sorry, I, I didn't notice this. Um, when making, composing music of worship, should we be concerned about the culture setting uh, around us? Yes, definitely. You should be concerned about the culture. You should be concerned about, concerned meaning, know, you know, know who you are addressing. And uh, it will really be helpful. Um, should we be mindful of not offending people or just go ahead and do it in the way we want to express? Well, uh, we can actually take people on a journey. Okay, to the first question, should we be concerned about the culture? Yes, because, you know, let's say the audience is very rural. They are used to this kind of expression of music. And then you, you know, you introduce a form of music that they're not, you know, familiar with. Then they're not going to find it relevant. They're not going to engage in worship. It's going to be difficult. Right? Or they might just shut down completely. And uh, uh, I think uh, we kind of have kind of seen that, right? So uh, I remember we went on a mission trip to, uh, this was to Siliguri, and then we had people from, um, you know, from the from West Bengal, actually, from Kolkata and other places. Um, so they had come, we had a, uh, we had a, you know, some two days of meetings. And uh, we went with songs in Hindi, right? Songs in Hindi for worship and said, okay, this is a bilingual actually, English and Hindi kind of thing. And, we, and also all the songs were kind of, see, suppose we're doing How Great Is Our God and the same song is sung in Hindi. Um, it was kind of westernized, right? You're using, you know, this kind of... Uh, four chord, five chord progressions and, you know, drums and bass and all that kind of thing, right? So we tried. Nothing happened. People were, in fact, I saw one, one lady actually yawning. Oh. And, you know, I was like, oh, God, it's not happening. Nothing is happening. People are, and these songs in our church, if we, we don't have to say anything. Everybody is lifting hands and worshipping. But here... People are looking around, sitting down. And these are young people also. And so we were like, oh God, something has to change. You know, and we're doing it in Hindi. It's not happening. Then there was one small group which came, one worship team which came from, I forget the name of the place. They came there and they sang, first of all, in Beng Bengali. Secondly, the kind of music was very rural. It was not urban. Right? So... They sang, and I saw the very auntie who was, you know, yawning. Now she's dancing. Literally. I was like, what happened? You know, it was as if one switch had changed. And, you know, it is very simple songs, and they're, they're singing. And then I can see I, from the back, I'm seeing everybody is engaged in worship. Everybody is a whole crowd. So, And that was a very important lesson. You got to know the culture. You got to be, you know, know the language. Um, and so it's very, you know, their question is that we should be, it's not just about offense, but it's about relating and, and serving the people. You know, you're not going to kind of introduce some, your style, you're serving the people. So uh, you should, 
yes, you should be mindful of the culture. You should also uh, be mindful of uh, you know how people relate, right? Oh, with the question of uh, offending people, let's say you know it's it's more like okay, it's maybe it sounds like film music or it sounds like you know something is too heavy or something. Um, maybe the older generation you know doesn't relate to it. So well, we can actually give time. Right, we don't need to force our way in. Right, we can give time, and you can explain, you can teach, and then uh, people will, you know, kind of warm up and open up. You know, that's that's a journey that we need to make. Right, but if it's a one-off thing, I would say, you know, serve them well. Right, what is the best way to serve? Just go for it. But if it's, you know, if you have time to, let's say, it's a church, and you you are going to be there over and over again then you can actually take time and journey with the congregation um, you know and and it'll 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 actually result in a change of culture culture it's going to take some time but you can journey right it's about how you know some people just know how to sing they look at it as singing they don't look at it as worship they are not familiar with lifting of hands they don't want to do it they they think that it is something else right uh, some other culture, some other church, some other denomination, they don't want to clap hands. In fact, very recently I was in a like a church congregation. I think uh, I, I went there for a wedding and after one special song, people clapped hands. right? And then the pastor came and said, you know, please don't clap hands okay, because it's irreverent in a place of worship. Right? So... So I said, I, so that is the understanding. So now, how do you, how can you change that? Okay, maybe you're going there as a worship team, and you're saying like, hey, people need to clap hands and feel free and lift hands and all that. But but this is the culture. This is what has been. How can you change it? It's going to take time. Right? It's going to take time. It, it has to start with the pastor and the leadership, and then flow down to the congregation to everyone. Right. So that's how it is. Good questions. Thank you. Okay, so so let's look at so we see all these uh, references, right? So we come back to that question. So what does that mean? You know, the you know the change of covenant in the different dispensation. So are these expressions of music and dance and you know shout shouts of joy and everything? Is it valid? We know it's valid. So, but how can I say it's valid? Then there is there seems to be an argument that you know it has to be only spirit and truth, therefore leave it. How can you say? Okay, so basically we look at scripture, right? Are there any references there? Right? First thing is when it comes to the change of covenants, we see that there is no instruction okay uh jackin says that we have instances of women pouring out precious oil worshiping with all we have singing hosanna we read in the book of revelation holy 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 and worshiping god and all reverence yes yeah so we basically look at scripture right and and then um we see okay what what does what word of god say right so uh when we look at um uh i think it's ephesians right um Okay, overall, uh, we, we can we we know that you know at the change of covenant, certain things stopped and certain things continued, right? We know that blood sacrifice or sacrifice of animals stopped you know, as an expression of worship. That stopped. Why? Because Jesus, the Lord Jesus Himself, is that perfect sacrifice. Because all the other sacrifices were pointing to this. It was a foreshadow. Of this perfect sacrifice with the Lord Himself, you know, He was carrying the sin of the whole world, and it was, it was, it was a everything else was a foreshadowing of that. So we see that, yes, uh, that stopped, right? So we there's no more expression of worship in that when because it stopped, right? If you look at uh, other specific scriptures like you know Ephesians five and. Uh, verses 18 onwards, you know, do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So it's a congregational thing, 
right? Speaking to one another, singing to one another in hymns and songs and spiritual um, sim hymns and spiritual so psalms and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord. So it's a it's a valid, you know, expression of uh, of all that. So it was not discontinued at the change of covenants. So we can continue on, right? So all these expressions are valid, and then we see specific instructions like this in the um, in the epistles which was the new testament church um, and also we see in in the book of revelation you know we see some of these uh, worship that was happening and and what was being sung what was being said uh, what was being spoken right um, because it says um, you know holy 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 and you are worthy and all that it is it is actually being spoken i'm looking at Re revelation 4 Right, Revelations four, we see that um, you know the living creatures, and they do not rest day and night, but they are saying. It says, right, not singing. They are saying, and also verse eleven says, you you know, there's uh, all the elders. They cast the crowns before the throne, and they are also saying, you are worthy, O Lord. Okay. Whereas when we look at Revelation five and uh, verse nine, it says, and they sang a new song um, to the Lord. They sang a new song. You are worthy, saying you are worthy. The words of the song were this: "You are worthy, O God." Right. So, we um, so we see that, and we know that there are, you know, there are references of trumpets and and so on. So, so we see that yes, uh, it did not stop. These expressions of worship are valid, okay, and uh, and the very fact that the Lord Jesus said that you know you need to worship in spirit and in truth. And the Father is seeking such worshippers, right? So, so as long as at the center of it is the Lord, and the expression of it is in spirit and truth, then all the other things um, are okay. As long as it's in truth, and it's uh, you know, it's not uh, like it is scriptural, and uh, you can go ahead. As as long as it does not contradict the truth, right? Okay. Okay. So in the New Testament. Okay, we start with the New Testament church, book of Acts. We see Acts chapter 2, people are born again, right? The church, I mean, uh, sorry, the Holy Spirit is poured out. People are already you know, born again. The 120 are there. They are. So sometimes we ask that, we can think, okay, all these disciples gathered together, either there or in these houses. Now, how did they worship? Right? Was there any way in which they Worship. We have that question, right? Because that is not mentioned, right? So one thing that we can look at is that okay, how did people worship in the synagogues, right? So those days there was a temple, there was these synagogues, and synagogues were basically uh, places where the Jewish people gathered on the Sabbath, um, and uh, they they worship Yahweh. So in the synagogue, how did it happen? Like so. It is important to ask that question and to study that because that is how the early Christians were all Jews. Yes, yeah, they were all Jews. Uh, we look at the disciples, we say everyone, they were all Jews. In fact, on the Feast of Pentecost, there were Jews who had gathered from everywhere, surrounding regions who had come there, and they witnessed the supernatural work of God in people's lives, praying in tongues and all that. So it was all Jews there. So. We also see that they worshipped in the temple. They went to the temple. They met in the houses, the early church. So, what did they do, right? So, in the Jewish synagogue, there were prayers being read. The word of God was read. The scriptures were read. The scrolls were read, and there was explanation given as well. Okay, so this was a form of worship when the people gathered together. Right, how it happened in the synagogue. So we read, you know, wherever Paul went on his missionary journeys, he went to the synagogue and there he reasoned with them and so on. So uh, there were these, you know, these hours of prayer. Right, we see Peter and John going to the temple, right, for the in the hour of prayer. So which means the early Jews, Jewish Christians, they they actually followed those hours of prayer. They went to the temple. They were worshiping Yahweh, but they followed that. They went, you know, during that hour of prayer, and that's when they met, you know, the person who was at the 
at the at the gate he could not walk and then peter you know he um uh, lifts him by the hand and he's healed and so on so all that happened but when we read we see that okay they followed this right so in the synagogue this was happening there was reading scripture there was explanation and these psalms right were sung and many of the psalms we read you know a song of ascents meaning that as people were climbing those hills to go um, as they were traveling uh, to worship the lord they would sing it right they would sing these songs they would chant these psalms right so that is what they did when we read about the last supper okay did they sing it says it they sang right at the last supper um the lord jesus everyone has gathered it says that after they sang a song they after they sang a hymn probably you can look at that um they went they went out right so where the lord jesus washed the feet and then you know after all that conversation they have uh, he has with judas and uh, they sing a hymn it's very interesting to see that they sing a hymn and then they move out okay uh, somebody finds the reference let me know um Uh, maybe it's in Mark or Luke. Okay, online students, if you find it, just put it there. Let me. Okay, um, Mark chapter fourteen. Mark chapter fourteen, verse. Um, like verse 22 onwards like talks about the lord's um lord institutes the lord's supper okay 14 onwards he says that whole communion that happening you know he says take eat this is my body and he broke the bread and he gave them the cup to drink and um, and he says this is the blood of the new covenant if you if you look at verse 26 it says and when they had sung a hymn they went out to the mount of olives right so so we see that okay when they gather together when they had fellowship um when they gather together to in the, for the purpose of worshiping yahweh they actually sang and so they continued like that in the early church okay right so we see this was a expression right they so we see that happening in the new testament or the uh, or the new testament church right so in contemporary times also so it is a valid expression right to to praise god to worship god in song so there's nothing you know we don't have to feel uncomfortable about it okay so the thing is this you know people have okay this have this kind of an argument said i i can't sing so does that mean that i cannot worship god you know i can't sing or i can't hold a tune okay so so the thing is this, you know, all of us are called to lead in singing or lead in worship, right? But all of us definitely can sing, right? And all of us probably do when nobody is watching. And, you know, even for those of us who consider our voices to be bad, we still do, right? When nobody is watching and you're suddenly happy and you just, you know, you just sing. So, so the, you know, this is, a very, this is a very important question, right? The question is not, can you sing, which means... Uh, a question about ability okay the question is that your does your heart have a song does your life have a song you know, which means that is there an overflow of a song to the lord right ephesians 5 the verse that we just read about being filled with the spirit and singing to one another in psalms and spiritual songs making melody in your heart to the lord doesn't talk about the quality of our voice yes when it when it comes to leading when it comes to ministering, yeah, maybe you should, you know, we should consider that because we don't want it to be a hindrance or a distraction for people. But all of us can, you know, all of us have a song in our hearts to the Lord. Okay. Um, 
So apparently there are 500 references in the word of God which talk about singing, which exhort a believer to sing. 500 references. There's a lot, right? So quite valid, right? Okay. Um, right. Uh, Let's look at some of these. Uh, uh, we looked at, uh, you know, uh, Ephesians five, Colossians three also talks about it. Colossians three sixteen, right? It says, "Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord." Okay. Um, Hebrews two verse twelve. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. And in that exhortation of prayer, James chapter 5, verse 13 says, Is anyone among you suffering? Okay. What is the what is the answer? What is the antidote? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Right? So, so we see that. So worship. Uh, or singing in worship, uh, or using music in worship, a very, uh, you know, something that was there, something that was there in the in the church for all those years, right? Okay. Um, right. Okay, so let's look at, um, you know, the tabernacle which the Lord asked Moses to build. And uh, you know we'll start with that, and then probably in the next class we will look at it in more detail, right? So, so we see that uh, in the book of Exodus we see that the Lord is giving uh, Moses specific instructions about how to build, uh, with what material to build, even the you know the kind of the furniture that needs to be there. And also, kind of some of the the colors of some of the fabric to be used, etc. Everything. It's a very detailed one that we see, right? And uh, and the and the thing is this: the Lord tells when Moses to go and speak to the Pharaoh and tell him that you know, let my people go, so that they will serve me. You know, they will go into the uh, uh, they will go into the wilderness, and they will there they will worship right so um, so we see that that the lord's intention about the tabernacle was for worship to institute a, a process institute a journey of worship okay um, so we see that the lord gives these instructions and uh, it happens when um, uh, to Mo, uh, it happens to Moses. God gives the instructions to Moses. It says in verse, uh, sorry, if you look at Exodus 25, okay? Exodus 25, uh, the Lord is talking about what materials to use and how to give and how people should give towards that, right? Everything is collected. Um, you can, we can read through it. Okay? It talks about different um, parts of the tabernacle, right? different parts of the tabernacle, different sections of the tabernacle, and what should be placed in every section, what are the kind of materials to be used, and all that. And he says this, you know, speak to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering from everyone who gives it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. And this is the offering that you shall take from them. And he goes on to list down. And all these, uh, it talks about gold, silver, bronze etc and also talks about fabric it talks about material and he says this is the purpose and let them make me a sanctuary that i may dwell among them right according to all that i show you <coughs> sorry <clears throat> that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all is furnish all its furnishings just show so you shall make it okay and then talks about the ark of the testimony the table for showbread Sorry, the golden lampstands and so on. Okay, so uh, we, we look at it in. Sorry, we look at it in detail in our uh, next class, 
and um, you can probably read through it also before we come so we get an understanding of it and the reason you know does it have any connotation does it have any symbolism to um, to the cross we see that yes it's a type of all that happened on the cross so it reflects the entire journey you know from the outer court to the holy of holies again you know it involves sacrifice or it's pointing to the cross it's a shadow and type like what the hebrews uh, the, uh, the book of hebrews says, it's a shadow and type of the reality of what happened uh, on the cross okay so we will look at that uh, in our next class okay now any questions so far um anything before we close anything at all <coughs> Okay, so um, so just to kind of backtrack and you know as we look at uh, this before we close, so this course, like for those who are you know interested in worship ministry and engaged in worship ministry, obviously you know it would it would definitely you know make a lot of sense and you know it's it's there you get a lot out of it and because you're practically you know and uh, you know personally engaged in it. But also for others who are not personally engaged, practically engaged in it, it, it also you know helps uh, because you see the you know you see the uh, the context in which you know worship happens. So we are able to explain you know or when when there are these you know these questions and doubts which you know which arise, we are able to explain. Not only that, but also the the practical administrative side of worship. Okay, so. Maybe one is called to be a, you know, a pastor, or a, you know, so you're just planting a church, and then, but you're not really engaged in, um, you know, in worship ministry as such. But then it gives you an over, overall picture of okay, this is what goes into developing a worship ministry, right? So because you can, sometimes it's just on free for all. Okay, we pick somebody and say, okay, you can sing. Okay, you do it, and say, okay, you lead and uh, you do this and so on. But then. Um, so we can avoid a lot of mistakes while developing a ministry, right? While developing this worship ministry in the local church, right? We can put it in the right place and and also very important, build a right culture for the worship ministry, right? Build the right culture in the church, so that <clears throat> right, uh, so so that it can be a you know spirit and truth worship. It can be something where where the Lord his power and his you know, walk with the Lord and everything is experienced and it brings people to a whole another level of uh, a life of worship right so it is helpful in all aspects um, as we do this course right okay so we'll stop here and we will meet again uh, next Friday for worship ministry right okay God bless thanks